Hi guys, welcome back to Snakes and Adders Intermediate Series, episode 21. Today we're discussing red milk snakes, whose Latin name is Lampropeltis triangulum cispila. Red milk snakes occur in the United States with distribution through eastern Kansas, Missouri, southern Illinois, southwest Indiana, Kentucky, western Tennessee, southern Iowa and northern Arkansas. So we've printed out a map of the US with a rough area of where we're concerned. Habitat for these milk snakes tends to be rocky hillsides, cedar forests, old fields and wetlands. They can also be found under tin and discarded waste construction materials or in dilapidated farm buildings. Husbandry for established animals is the same for many other milk snakes, just on a smaller scale. In truth, care is probably more akin to the mountain king snakes, Lampropeltis paramolana, and the Mexican kings, previously Lampropeltis mexicana. A 30 by 15 by 15 vivarium, so 75 by roughly 40 by 40 centimetres, will suffice for a single animal. Heat can be provided from an under tank heater, a heat pad, uh, a ceramic bulb or chi, as some people call it, ceramic heat emitter, or a deep heat projector. Of course, these should be controlled by a reliable thermostat. Your day-to-day -day temperatures at the basking spot should be between 28 and 30 degrees Celsius, with the opportunity to move away. Nighttime temperatures can drop to between 20 and 22 degrees Celsius without issue. Along the length of the tank, hide should be provided. And because these animals are predominantly burrowers and very secretive, multiple hides would be recommended. And not necessarily the arc type, more flat pieces that they could maybe wedge themselves under or in between, which would be more reflective of their natural habit. Substrate choices obviously should be friable and loose so that they can burrow if they so wish. So we could use lignocell, we could use aspen, we could use beech chippings. I suppose we could use corn cob, ground walnut kernels, which, uh, what was that called now? Nature's blend or something it used to be called. As well as a multitude of other, maybe uh, soil and sand mixes, maybe with some extra soil mixed into it so it's less sand content, but so that they can burrow and it'll maybe retain itself in a burrow for the people that want it to be truly naturalistic a fresh water bowl that the animal can submerge itself in at the cool end and optional uv lighting uh, um, there is a move for providing full spectrum lighting such as this you would use the um, shade dweller tube that's provided by arcadia which is a uv index of one i think 30 centimeters away which is fine for just low output for to see our animals in the full spectrum of light uh, and as you can appreciate that makes for a very spectacular sight given how beautiful this species is. These snakes are predominantly subterranean and secretive in nature. They utilise burrows and cracks and fissures in the rock network to navigate around. They eat a variety of skinks and small burrowing snake species. Mammals will enter their natural diet later in their life cycle. An author called Stebbins in a field guide to collecting snakes noted that they were most commonly encountered at the beginning and end of the season. Mid-season they were very rarely encountered and we can see the season which we've gone here which we'll go through in our climate data that we analyse it towards the end. But usually towards the beginning and towards the end they were collected and they tend to just disappear during the height of the season. Copulation occurs in spring around April and May and resultant eggs are deposited June to July. They utilise the summer heat to incubate those eggs which hatch later uh, in August or September. So, so far, not a whole heap to suggest that this animal warrants to be in the intermediate series. Uh, and if you look at the stable mates through the rest of the intermediate series, you know, you're you, you racking your brains as well, what on earth could be the problem? It's the babies. The babies are tiny when they are born. Believe it or not, this is a pretty much mature male. So for a milk snake, he is minuscule. When you think that, uh, well, Lampropeltis abnorma, as it is now, the Honduran, maximum big quoted sizes of six and a half, seven feet. And yet we've got a snake here that's barely 80 centimeters long, 70 centimeters long. And he's a proven breeding male. So, yeah, somewhat uh, slightly different in scale. 
So because they're so small, they are simply incapable of eating newborn mouse pinks. And the smallest, and they are the smallest and most readily available prey in our arsenal. It's not that easy to get hold of tiny Eumaces species skinks in the UK pet trade, particularly if we were going to be using them as feeder prey. So that's where our problem lies. Their head is also really, really ill-defined. Um, there's next to no sort of neck. It's just very, very small and cute, but small all the same. We've got a San Luis Potosi King, which I'll just show you one for one second here. So this San Luis is maybe the, just slightly shorter, but there is some definite echoes here, both in patination and in the shape and size, but the head on the milk snake is smaller and therefore you can see why they would struggle i mean that said these can be a pain in the ass to get going as well when they want to be let me just shut you up they don't really escapes so it's entirely feasible given that the animals would be hatching out late august early september that the babies may well have to brew mate before they start kicking in feeding before they've gained any real weight or size and they just have to admit defeat and take to uh take to those deep burrows to try and avoid the awful winter weather in parts of their range keepers have noted that the use of a pinky pump becomes indispensable with babies and also using mouse tails that we chop off the bodies of our bigger feeder stock and feed in the mouse tails as well. This requires masses of patience and time uh, for the animals to establish and grow. And we obviously need to take care of this as expediently as possible to avoid stressing the animal out by having it out for too long. Plus, if we've produced babies and we've got a full litter of them, that's a fair amount of time to feed eight or ten youngsters their force-fed or assist-fed mouse tail. So yeah, it, it, it's interesting. Once established and feeding on their own, they actually reset to be introducing species um, and th the rest of their life cycle is that of a shy and secretive snake but they are tame tractable and feed reasonably well as captive bred animals so they don't really pose us too many issues so it is really isolated to that first part of their life cycle that puts them into the intermediate series Brumation is used to encourage copulatory behavior and to mimic the natural cycles that they would experience it's also been cited in studies undertaken on Tamnophis species, which are garter snakes. Thank you, Francis. Yes, I was listening and I was reading. Um, that it, ex it was proven to extend uh, the longevity of captive stock by giving them their brumation. And this is regardless of whether we are trying to introduce copulatory action or not. It was proven to be useful for burning excess fat and therefore keeping the animals more lean and more in their natural state. Uh, we keep them a bit more nutritionally replete, replete than they are in the wild, i.e. we create fat snakes and we have to be careful and the brumation can be a useful tool for addressing that. And also animals that begin to stutter with food, a good brumation and cool down usually snaps them straight back into feeding and gets them going. So now we're going to have a quick look at the weather patterns. So as always, I mean, well not always, we've introduced it recently. Particularly, I think it started mainly with the Peter's banded skinks. When they're from exotic locations or desert locations, it makes sense. For something that's domestic for our American viewers, of which there's a lot, particularly on YouTube, it might seem strange that we're analysing your weather data, but, you know, we're from the UK, so we need to be able to do that. And if we do European species equally, we will print, we will print out the data and use that, so you can use it for doing ladder snakes or Russian rat snakes or whatever else. So we picked five areas of their natural distribution which are kansas city missouri fayetteville arkansas there's moines iowa lone oak park kentucky and pittsburgh kansas and we can see the arcs the coolest overall is io which is the most northern of the states and the warmest overall is looks like kansas pittsburgh so what we've got is a peak temperature where are we approaching 32 degrees that seems to be our peak temperature midsummer, 32 Celsius, uh, both in our Kansas and Missouri. Uh, oh, 33, sorry, Pittsburgh, Kansas, there you go. Yeah, and it's that for June and July. Uh, our cool downs are quite pronounced. 
Now what we've drawn on, which we referenced last time in one of our climate data bits, was the cutoff point at which animals would begin uh, their brumation naturally. And that's what these dotted lines represent. Once we start hitting that 13 degrees, 12, 13 degrees Celsius, that's it, we're, we're, we're burying away. So from this point onwards, they're asleep. Then they're awake and feeding and then asleep again. When we look at the nighttime low, we can see here that this is our frost line. And for a period of the year, all of the locations disappear beneath that frost line. So the animals almost certainly will be hidden away during this period. And again, would not break cover until mid to late April and then begin feeding. And they would start have to feed in a frenzied way, particularly if Stebbins report is right, where during the height of the season, you don't really see them and they're not found. So, they, you know, they're loading up at two specific, specific points of the season. Dead interesting. So, yeah, we've got uh, an analysis there. I will try and include them in the images, particularly on the Facebook post. Um, so this species was first described by Edward Drinker Cope in 1889 as Ophibolus doliatus cispilus. I would tell you all the changes that take place, but it would take forever and it'd be boring. And the um, land propelled is triangular and complex as it was, has been elevated into all sorts of different species, which uh, I will explain in a second. So these were last confirmed as land propelled is triangulum cispila by Gaia in 2018. The triangulum species and the three subspecies, triangulum triangulum, triangulum amora, and Triangulum cispila are all endemic to the USA. So this is now a quick note on the preservation of lines. And this refers to the changes that have been made to the classification of Lampropeltis triangulum. Lampropeltis triangulum was previously all-encompassing and included all milk snakes. In 2014, scientists got involved and basically ruined our lives as hobbyists. Many previously separate subspecies were grouped together or became synonymous with one another. Sinaloan milk snakes, Nelson's milk snakes, Pueblan milk snakes and Conan milk snakes all became Lampropeltis polyzona. Honduran milk snakes became Lampropeltis abnorma, along with a previously distinct subspecies, which includes Stuart's milks, I believe. So, I, look, I understand that this is science, and you're all doing your, your, your mitochondrial DNA and all these analysis and stuff. But after 30 or 40 years of all those hobbyists breeding and keeping separate the lines of, I mean, for example, the polyzona complex there, Sinaloa, which was Lampropeltis triangulum sinaloi, Nelson's Lampropeltis triangulum nelsoni, Pueblin's Lampropeltis triangulum cambelli, and Conan's milk snake Lampropeltis triangulum cananti, they, they, they've all been bred separately and kept as separate lines. Now, bear with me. I, I understand that, that this is science, um, but, and, and, you know, the hobby has chosen to ring fence the previous definitions. I would encourage people to maybe just hold fast on maybe viewing the polyzona group all as one group, because for the simple reason, in five years, some other scientist from some other university who has to justify their tenure may do another paper and decide that they're all distinct subspecies again, at which point we've spent the last decade blurring and muddying the bloodlines that we've held so dear for so long. You know, th this is what we've got to understand, that these things are permanently in a state of flux. And whilst a lot of keepers see science as the absolute ultimate must not be challenged, well, of course it can be. The hobby is the hobby. The science is the science. We have distinct groups of Sinaloans, Pueblins, Conans, uh, Hondurans, and all the other species as well. On the basis that now we've decided that five of them, or four of them, sorry, have just gone wallop into one group, without any subclassification or subspecies. So Lampropeltis polyzona sinaloi or polyzona nelsoni, they're just polyzona. This is an issue. Now, of course, 
they may be classed as VAR Sinaloa and VAR Nelson I. But the papers that we read or that get published need to be explicit to keep them as separate locality types so that we don't just hybridize them all by thinking, oh, well, science tells us they're all the same. And then in actual fact, some other herd that comes along and decides to reclassify them all back into Sinaloa, Nelson I, Campbelli and Canante. You know, it's it, it just can't. We can't do it. And once once that the horse has bolted, there's no getting it back. So keep them pure. I hope you've enjoyed that video. Um, I think this is a wonderful species. But owing to how difficult the babies are to establish, definitely not a beginner. Uh, if you get an adult, then yeah, they, they would default back into the beginner snakes and the, um, the introducing series. We certainly wouldn't introduce the, uh, include this in a, a beginner snakes guide, for example, simply because it isn't a beginner skill set to be a system force feeding babies as part of their natural life cycle in captivity because we can't get hold of prey small enough. Uh, it's not, not a responsible way to be. We'll keep the videos coming. I hope you enjoy them with the, the added bits and pieces that we're doing to try and make them more informative. Rather than using opinion, we're trying to use fact, which is great. So uh, we'll see you all soon. And from Snakes and Adders, peace.